Very well. Well, um, today we are going to talk about uh, open innovation. And before starting the session, I would like to know that if you have uh, ever heard of the term open innovation and how do you perceive open innovation and when you hear or see the word open, what comes first to your mind? So please share with me your thoughts by typing in the chat box um, what you know about open innovation and how do you perceive it. The questions are already posted. All right. Okay, Mustafa is also right. Okay, Lida is also correct. Very well. Well, today we will talk about closed versus open innovation paradigms how to move from close to open innovation, what are the strategies, what are the tactics. Also, we touch upon uh, key success factors and we conclude at the end. This is a nice quote from Einstein, um, from Edison, sorry. Uh, I find out what the world needs, then I go ahead and try to invent it. It has to do with the uh, with a market of innovation. It means that you only innovate uh, what people need. When there is a market, when there is a need, then you go and invent it. Because if you invent something people don't need, there is no commercial benefit for it. So I found this very nice to put it here at the very beginning. Well, what is open innovation? Open innovation means that valuable ideas uh, can come from inside or outside the company. So there is a two-way street. You don't think always only about your company, about internal resources, but you think also about outside and external resources. Of course, this is not a very complete definition. But I wanted to start with a very simple definition. Well, open innovation is about organizations making greater use of external ideas and technologies. And we need to know why we need open innovation. So, if I ask you why we need to use external ideas and external technologies and external knowledge, why do we need to go for that? Why can we not just use our own resources where we can control them very well, where we can see how they work very well, and you have more managerial control over what we have inside our firm than what belongs to others, literally. So there should be a good reason for this. 
because the outsider knows more about the needs. By outsider, what? Who do you mean, uh, Amman? Why do they need more about our the needs? Needs of whom? Okay, we don't have complete ideas. But but why don't we have complete ideas? Why don't we have all the ideas? If you mean this, Farid. Okay, new ideas. Internal employees can also come with new ideas, Lida. Why why do you think new ideas only come from outside? So Farid believes that we only look at the inside as one side of the story. We need to know about the other side of the story as well. And this is what? This is the market? This is the competitor? What is the other side? No. Mustafa says the external environment can judge better regarding our strengths and weaknesses. External environment does not judge us. I mean, you you have a company, you run your company. If you lose and you go out of business, you go out of business. If you succeed, you succeed. So what do you mean by judge us? How 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 environment judge our products? You need to clarify. You li need to link it. When you say external environment, is it a person? Is it a company? Is it an association? Is it government? Is it who? Who is it? Who is external environment? Who judges our products? And if they judge our product, do, do they judge the quality of the product? Do they judge the price of the product? Do they judge the effectiveness of the product? Okay. Now it's more specific. Customers, consumers, users, okay. So we can move to why do we need open innovation? Firstly, can I afford to hire every smart man in the world? When you want to build, to manufacture a product, to design a product, if you want to come up uh, with a medicine that cures HIV, for example, can you say that in my uh, drug uh, or pharmaceutical company, I can hire all the smart doctors in the world? Can you say that I can hire all the smart people to work in my lab? If the answer is yes, then you don't need open innovation because you go and hire them. If the answer is no, then you have to find a solution. Secondly, uh, if I wasn't to go beyond conventional boundaries of my fear and be innovative, I need fresh ideas from outside. So, if you want to not to be conventional, because if you want to be conventional, if you are, for example, producing traditional rocks and this is something very traditional and conventional. Apparently, you don't need much of the idea, but if you have a global market with a lot of global customers, international customers, you cannot afford being conventional. You need to be innovative. And for this, you need to know what other customers in other countries think about you. So. Basically, if you look at this slide and you look at the 
innovation management uh, process, you see that part of the innovation is linked to the internal resources and part of the innovation management process is linked to external uh, resources. You have, for example, marketing, you have, for example, sales, you have uh, pro procurement, you have production, you have R&D, you have services, and you have a couple of other functions here. And when you go to the external side of innovation management process, you have universities, research institutes, you have suppliers, you have customers, consumers, users, you have competitors, you have innovation agents, you have entrepreneurs, and you can add to this box as well. So innovation management process does not limit to this internal side, but also has an external side to it. So, in this uh, slide, you see who is involved in open innovation process. It's a matrix. On the left-hand side, we have outside, inside cluster, inside company, experts, partners, everyone. So, when, when it's very narrow, you know, uh, if you look at some businesses, they seek advice, for example, uh, once in a blue moon from consultancy firms and have a few partners, mainly they have one or two partners, and they think that forming a small uh, cluster, which is mainly a homogeneous, because when you form a cluster, if you are, for example, in shoe manufacturing field, if you form a cluster of manufacturing fields, you have, for example, two, three shoe manufacturers who form a cluster with you. So it's a very homogeneous group. So there is a high possibility that what you think in your shoe factory is roughly the same thing when you move to another shoe factory in your cluster, is you find the same ideas, the same mentality. If you have an idea of how to reduce the cost per shoes, most probably when you move to another uh, cluster member, you find the same ideas there. So, in fact, um, this is a very closed circle. So, um, you are isolated, even if you are a few, you are a few isolated companies. And this is a, a way from what we know as the spirit of open innovation. Because open innovation is not actually, and is not only a cluster development. It is about including every possible uh, source. And cluster, Lida asked about a cluster. Uh, if you have um, company A and company B and company C, D, E, F, company A and B and C form a cluster. It means that they work together, they help each other. They share ideas. Company B and D can form another cluster. And company F may be standalone. So if you share ideas within this cluster, because it's a very it's a very limited space. After a while you have all the same ideas. It happens again here, and it happens here. So this is not what we mean open innovation. Open innovation 
is when you have outside everyone in a broad term. This is very narrow. This is also very narrow because there's only a cluster, some partners. This is a broad sense and this is open innovation. So open innovation is not only a cluster development, it is about including every possible source. This is a very good slide in a sense that it has to do with the sources of idea generation. What are the sources of new innovative ideas? Now that you are familiar with internal and external sources, it is good also to reveal to you some statistics because you know that, for example, customers are important but you don't know how important they are. So, a statistics is a good way of convincing people about how important the concepts are. If you look at here, you would see easily that um, if we take internal into account, the most important source of ideas are employees. And many people thought that the most important, very conventional actually people, think that the most important ideas come from R&D or they think that uh, they come from uh, CEO, uh, but the big boss always has the ideas. But the statistics show that they're all wrong. What is very important in a company is employee. When you move from internal to external, you see that main ideas and most of the ideas come from business partners and customers. So very often you have seen that people go to consultants or they watch the competitors to copy or they go to associations of trade groups, conferences or academia. But the truth is the majority of innovative ideas are with customers and business partners. And there is a marginal difference between them in percentage. If you bring this down you will see that the difference is less than 3%. So this is the difference actually. This margin here is the difference, is less than 3%. Now let's look at this slide. Most of the world's R&D is outside of your company. This slide shows the total R&D expenditures in U.S. billion dollars and the percentage of world total by region. So, in Africa, 5 billion. In Europe, 203 billion. In Asia, 209. In North America, 285. This is the amount of dollars spent on R&D expenditures and also the percentage, 27, 8.7918. General electric, electric R&D expenditures in 2007 was 5.7 billion. It's a lot. Uh, General Electric has spent literally 5.7 billion, Africa is 5 billion, so General Electric has spent more than whole African continent on R&D. 
But what I want to tell you is something else. Because if you are having a very rich company like General Electric or a very small one which has hardly an R&D division, you need to be advised that most of the world R&D expenditures are outside your company. Even GE's total R&D expenditure forms just a very small portion of the world total R&D. Actually, I would like you to know, and I want to ask you, what does that mean when, when General Electric's total expenditure forms just a very small portion of the world R&D? What, the, what does that mean? How do you interpret how do you interpret this? Oceania is Australia and New Zealand. So I want your opinion on this G R and D expenditures. You can think about it. The question is very clear. When we say that General Electric's total R&D expenditure forms just a very small portion of the world total R&D, what can we learn from these uh, statistics? Wrong, Mustafa. This is wrong. Because it's not relevant to our discussion. Uh, Aman is right. Aman he says comparing it to the world's R&D expenditure, it is a small part of total R&D. But Aman, you have part of the answer. But how do you interpret this? Because I say Aman has two dollars, Farid has five dollars, Mustafa has eight dollars. Who has? The, who is the richest? Uh, somebody says Mustafa is the richest because Mustafa has more dollars than anyone else. Okay, but what does that mean? Does that mean that Mustafa? you need to go one step further, can buy a Mercedes, or does that mean that Mustafa is only richest among the three? Haman's answer is open to everyone. You should be able to see that. No. It's, it's not a point. Uh, everybody knows that R&D is capital intensive in, in these in industries and no. I want you to think of big picture. What is the today's lesson open innovation? How can I go from this slide to open innovation? How can I link this slide to open innovation? Imagine General Electric is here. This is General Electric. Okay. This is General Electric. They have R&D. Their R&D looks very much five billion dollars. You can you can do a lot of things with this money. You can build a city. 
But it's still, where is $5 billion, where is 285? No, 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 Aman. You are thinking of a very uh, small part. You need to see the big picture. I'm looking for big picture here, not a small picture. Big picture. What is the big picture? The big picture is no matter what you own in house, no matter how much you spend on your R&D, no matter how many billion dollars you spend on your R&D, it is important how strong your connection to the outside world is. It matters to move from solely knowledge creation to knowledge connection. If this is the conclusion, then you are the lucky winner. You, you don't need to listen to to rest of what I'm saying if you get this point here. What I'm trying to say is that even if you spend five billion dollars on R&D, you are still a small, very small portion. You have a very small portion of knowledge. So, if you want to be successful, you need still to connect with others. What I'm trying to say that it's not how much you spend in your R&D. It's a still a lot of this knowledge is produced in other parts. So if you do not connect, you lose this amount of knowledge. You lose it. Let me, let me make it a tougher one. G loses this amount of knowledge also, G loses other countries in the on other companies in the United States, and what is left of GE, a a small island here. So it is a very serious situation when you spend five billion. Actually, this is six billion, almost three hundred million less than six. Five, five billion and seven hundred million dollars you spend on R&D and you still are a, a small island here. Island of knowledge. So that is why open innovation is important because you miss on a lot of other knowledge creation here. It's not only about a partner, it's not only about a cluster, it's not only about a few connections, no. It's about everyone, everywhere can be a source of idea and knowledge for your problem. It means that I'm on that you have to always come up with a mechanism to pull the resources in the world together. And Farid, after eight session, asks, what is R&D? It means that Farid doesn't read at all. After, after eight session, Farid doesn't know R&D. It's very surprising. Because R&D means research and development, and if you have read your book, you should have known that, better than anyone else. Yes, Abaydullah is getting it right. Okay, now let's move to the next slide. So, we need to know 
what is really closed innovation paradigm or closed innovation mindset? You have a few points here. Successful 20th century approach. Well, let's only focus on internal ideas. Let's let's build a wall around our fortified castle, uh, the centralized knowledge landscape. When you look at this picture, you will see a castle with very strong walls. Whatever happens in the castle happens in the castle. Nobody is going to get to know about that. Nobody is going to find out about that. Nobody can steal it. It's a very secure location. So, what is really closed innovation paradigm? How different can it be from open innovation paradigm? And is it a radical shift or a mild one? These are the questions we, we need to answer. And these are normally the questions that come to our minds when we think of closed versus open innovation paradigm. And when we talk about closed innovation paradigm, when we have the example of a very fortified castle, we can easily associate the associate this with a mindset which says many important achievements and many successes are rooted only in our own R&D. The approach of closed innovation is that everything is fundamentally happening inside and the focus is on inside and the environment that we have in our business corporation. This was the 20th century mentality. This was the 20th century approach and they were successful because in that age there was no internet and the world was not as close as the world it is today. The platform of such as internet, the platform of social media, the platform of communications and travel, all of this bring the world closer and closer. So the opportunity is there, the platform is there, the tool is there, it is up to you to use it and how you use it. If in the past closed innovation model was successful, that does not mean that in 21st century it will be successful again. If one day a scientist in an office, in a laboratory, came up with something and the company could sell the product and could get rich, that does not mean that today is the same scenario because the knowledge landscape, exactly the world is, the word is knowledge landscape. The knowledge landscape has changed and the focus now is different. In 20th century, the Yeah, it's exactly Muhammad Aziz. In in twentieth century, when when closed innovation paradigm was very common, there was a set of principles. One of them was the smart people in our field work for us. So you had this mentality. You had the mentality that the profit from R and D if you want to profit from your research and development department, you must discover it yourself, develop it yourself, 
sell it yourself. And if we discover it ourselves, we will get it to the market first. It's a very delicate thing. It sounds very logical. If we discover it ourselves, we get it to the market first. This is a very strong claim. And I will talk about it. Yes, ship means to transfer. The company that gets an innovation to market first will win. This was the mentality. This was the principle. If we create the most and the best ideas in the industry, we will win. We should control our intellectual property so that our competitors don't profit from our ideas. If you look at this slide, every one of these points look very logical on surface. But, for example, if I want to cite a cite from Henry Chesperow, which says, for example, if you come up with a mouse trap, imagine this is a mouse trap, okay? So you put the cheese here, this is the cheese. And this is the mice, okay? This is a fat mice. Um, this this mouse actually comes and smells the cheese here, and the mouse comes here and gets the cheese, and the poor mouse is a stock here. So if your company builds this mouse trap, this is a mouse trap, okay? If your company makes these mouse traps in the closed innovation mentality, if the company makes it, he can get it to market first and when he get it to market first he can benefit from it financially if you discover it you should develop it and you should ship it send it to market and all the smart people work for you so you come with the best master okay this is the closed men mentality in the open innovation mentality we say that because you make a very efficient mouse trap which catches all the mice. It does not mean that you can sell this mouse trap. Because maybe you can best the, make the best mouse trap in the world, but that does not guarantee that you have the best marketing tool in the world. Maybe company A makes the mousetrap, which is very good. The moment you install this, every mice, every mouse is caught. But company B does the marketing. Maybe there is a company C involved here, which does the shipping. Maybe there is a company D involved here which does the after sales services because when you catch a lot of mice, uh, the mouse trap becomes old and uh, deficient and it needs to be repaired to catch more mice. So we discover it, we ship it, we sell it, we market it, V, 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 my company, my company, my company. It's not going to work always. And that's the, that's the that's the paradigm shift. So we have we have transferred from that stage our mentality to a different stage, which is open innovation. So you re, you can think of closed innovation model as, for example, this is company A produces the mousetrap and then market it 
mark is going to market it in the market, sells it. So it does the marketing and sells it. This is company B. They have also another mousetrap and they sell their mousetrap in the market. There is no link between company A and company B. Company A builds, for example, a toothbrush and sells it in the market. Company B makes, for example, uh, let's say telephones and sells the telephone in a market. So these companies, they never communicate with each other. Well, what are the golden questions? These are the golden questions. What is the best way to ensure leadership in the industry? to create new and improved products to sell to the market in the future? What is the best way for you to pursue the creation of these new products and services? What is the useful knowledge you need? Where is the useful knowledge you need? How can you incorporate this knowledge into your business? So. These are the very critical questions. And if you find answers to these questions, you have actually mastered a new mentality. And the answer is not all with me. I mean, you have to think about them. The way Every business is different. Every company is different. So you should find the way to incorporate new knowledge into your business model. For one company, useful knowledge is with customers. For another, is with suppliers. For another, if if you are in a in a food industry and you sell, for example, prepared meal, like sandwiches. What is very important with you is that your sandwich has one day expiry date, only one day or two days, because people need to eat fresh sandwiches. The most important part of your value chain is how to transfer the sandwich from factory to the supermarket. So your useful knowledge is in the transport part. You have to find it with transport partners. If you sell, for example, medicine, you work with lab scientists and doctors and patients, and your useful knowledge lies elsewhere because Normally, medicines have what, six months, one year lifetime, and they transfer them with, with bridges. And, and that's less important than, than the efficacy of the drug. So every business is different, but the questions remain the same. So and in light of our discussion of open innovation, we have, for example, Berlin well, I, I put this example because I wanted you to see when you open up what happens. This is Berlin before falling the wall, when the West Germany and East Germany were separated. Look at the pictures. It's a very, very demotivating picture. And just see what happens when the wall falls.
you see there is a huge difference between the two times. This Berlin is the cultural capital of Germany, beautiful, modern, multicultural, multinational, and this Berlin is just a bunch of ruins. And this is happens when you finally adopt a very successful open innovation paradigm. So open innovation, of course there are a lot of challenges while adopting open innovation paradigm. Of course it's a new field of a study at the moment. Many researchers study open innovation. Many researchers want to overcome the challenges of open innovation. And of course, I send you some papers you can read. But it does not mean that if it's a challenging way of conducting business and handling business, it does not mean if it's challenging, you cannot do it. Because IBM, for example, has done vast vast amount of open innovation shifts and it's very successful now. What are now open innovation principles? Not all the smart people work for us, therefore we need to work with the smart people inside and outside the company. Look how the principles change. External R&D can create significant value. Internal R&D is needed to claim some portion of that value. We don't have to originate the research to profit from it. Maybe Obedullah has a research lab which is very well equipped. I go to Obedullah, I, re I say, Obedullah, you do the research for me, I pay you. And because Ubaidullah has 10 or 15 customers, the, uh, the cost of research that Ubaidullah does is much cheaper than the time I want to, for example, do that research. Think of if you buy a big printer and put it on the floor and everyone makes prints, or if you want to buy a printer for every employee in the office. Building a better business model is better than getting to market first. If we make the best use of internal and external ideas, we will win. We should profit from others' use of our intellectual property. It means that. And, I, and it's not, this one is not very new because it's about licensing. For example, you have McDonald's in the States and then you want to have McDonald's in Afghanistan. You pay the license, you, 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 you pay, they call it royalty fees. You franchise McDonald's into Afghanistan and you pay the license fees every month and you can sell the product. So it is in the States, you have not invented, you have not built it. You have not done any marketing for the McDonald's brand, but you pay something, you, li you pay license fees, and you use it. And we should buy others' IP whenever it advances our own business model. So, open innovation paradigm, it's externally focused collaborative innovation. Look at this. In the previous picture, we had the wall of China between the two companies. In this new picture, we don't have the wall of China. We see that these are ideas, projects, ideas. Company A has some projects and ideas like this, which go to a new market. 
Company B has some ideas which cannot be used in the current, current market. So Company B gives the ideas to Company A and Company A markets these ideas. And Company A market the ideas of Company B. Also, Company B has a current market, but some of ideas in the current market cannot be marketed, cannot be sold. So they commercialize these ideas. They commercialize these ideas. They put the ideas into new products and services and just shift them into the new market. So as you see, ideas move from one company to another company and they are commercialized in different markets. While in the very traditional model there is no new market, only there is company B with its market share, there is company A with its own market share, everything happens here. And that's it. So open innovation is crazy because it's it's busy, it's collaborative, it's a lot of connection. On the other hand, it's very profitable. Now I want you to look at these three important facts of open innovation for a moment. everyone hear me? Hello? Okay. Navid has, this, has a question and says, cons, has a comment and says, consultancy is a new phenomenon. I have to first say that no, consultancy is not a new phenomenon. It's a very old phenomenon. So this part is not true. And it's not about selling ideas. I mean, it is. Let me give you an example to clarify this. Um, if company A produces um, chips, produces uh, um, IT chips, microprocessors. They have a laboratory of many hardware engineers, computer engineers, and they build different kind of chips, transistors, microprocessors. Sometimes they come up with a piece of technology which cannot be used in the mainstream market. This technology is built because when scientists work together, they discover new things which might not be completely related to the company's scope of activities. Therefore, they come up with a new technology just by chance or on the way of their 
mainstream technology development and they don't know what to do with this extra technology, extra knowledge, extra production. Sometimes it's also called byproduct technology. So what they do is that they try to find a company that needs this technology and this company will buy the technology and use it and commercialize it. It's like you have, for example, you are in the, in the, let's say um, you have a chemi chemistry lab and you do a lot of analysis for different products. Suddenly your scientist discovers a formula and, okay, let's give you a very good example. Viagra. Viagra was used for health, for heart problems. And Viagra had a primary purpose of curing heart problems. So if you are selling heart drugs, definitely Viagra is your drug. But then suddenly they found out that Viagra has other purposes as well. And the, another company marketed Viagra for a different purpose. So if you cannot market it and you find it some other uses somewhere else, you can go for it. The main point is, is here not to waste the technology. That's the main point. So three important facts. Open innovation is here to stay. Open innovation is a big cultural change and new capabilities need to be built. So again, we have a change here, change management, because you want to move from closed innovation into open innovation. So, are you ready to change? And if you want to change, what are the typical issues on the outset? Well, if you remember correctly from the very beginning of the slide, we have business partners and customers as the most important sources of innovative ideas. And the typical question asks here is that we should ask ourselves before the change process, we need um, a cultural readiness and we need to see if there is a cultural fit between our partners and us. What are the barriers? So, you have to evaluate your situation and partner situations. You have to ask yourself if you have an open mindset and you are culturally ready to change. Do you have a good innovation strategy? Do you have supporting networks? Do you have tight collaboration with your partners? Are you effectively working with partners? So that's why I say that if there is a cultural fit between your company and partner's company, do your partners create the right ideas? Do you effectively leverage your partner's ideas? And these are very, very important points to consider. For example, in collaborating with partners, your partner should know your strategy and understand where you want to innovate. If you want to innovate, for example, in your value chain, I don't know if you are familiar with value chain, but this is a very important part. 
For example, if you have Kentucky Fried Chicken and your problem is how I can send my chickens, the raw chickens, to the different parts of the country so that they are able to cook the chicken and sell Kentucky Fried Chicken, KFC, you want to innovate in your transport function. So you need to talk with your transportation partners, the shipping partners. These are the partners you know what is your innovation strategy. You want to reduce the cost or you want to increase the speed of delivery or you want to change the mode of delivery and these are the partners that should be familiar with your ideas about how to innovate and where to innovate. You need to have effective collaboration and effectively leveraging the expertise and capabilities of your partners in your product development process or in any, any function of your business. And this requires a lot of meeting and joint discussions and task force and teamwork. So it's a lot of communication. It's a lot of time spending. It's a lot of analysis. And these are the changes that happen to your company when you want to adopt open innovation. So nothing is more dangerous than a dogmatic worldview. And by dogmatic, I mean nothing more constraining, more blinding to innovation, more destructive of openness to novelty. So if you're dogmatic, if you want to think closed, but you like to have an open business model, it does not work like that. So the change should come from top, from mindset, from culture down to the business functions. I don't understand Ubaidullah's idea. And Navid has a problem, has a question. Open innovation is here to stay means that open innovation is now the leading paradigm. Don't think that it is just a fashionable idea. Don't think that it will go away in one year or two years. So it is here to stay. It means that it's serious stuff. We should think about it. We don't think about it. Our competitors think about it and they win the game. Okay, we have also open innovation enablers, open standards, open architecture, open source, and we would like to talk about them one by one. Open standards means we are oriented towards future performance. We are open-minded businessmen. We create open innovation ecosystem. An ecosystem has to do with the structures, with overlapping, with connection, with communication. We have an open culture with no prejudice. We learn from every possible source on earth. We believe that external ideas come mainly from our business partners and customers, so we accept them. One thing that I want to tell you is that if you want to understand really the process of open innovation, you need to get a job in a company or at least a training period 
in order to really get involved with innovation process. It's not about only reading the theoretical part. It's about feeling it. You need to have this experience and mix your theory with experience in order to really learn how to manage open innovation processes. So this slide this talks about standards that we need to put in place. And it goes on to how you know more about your partner activities. And this all has to do with bringing your partner closer to your business model because some companies keep the partners at arm's length. It means that they keep the distance between their partners and their company. Some other firms which follow open innovation paradigm, they try to get closer to their partners. So this closeness means sharing ideas, means discussing the problem together. Because you don't say, this company is our partner, it just has this responsibility. No, you can share the problem with the partner. You can share your strategy with the partner. Of course, there should be a level of trust there. Nobody ignores that, but if you don't share it, you cannot use your partner's ideas. You need also to do the same with your customers. And customers here does not necessarily mean individual customers, because if you are selling printers to big companies, those big companies are your customers. They use your printers. They buy a lot of printers from you, so you can discuss with them about how to improve the product. You don't need always to think how you in improve your printer because you, do, you produce your printers. No. You ask your customers how to improve your printers, which you are going to build. We need to improve information sharing within the organization and information inflow and outflow process. And we believe that by setting up horizontal communication, horizontal means not vertical, not top-down. Horizontal is departmental, between departments, among departments, between companies, among companies, among partners, customers, suppliers, research institutes, university communication, and everything. Respect two-way communications between employees and managers and between employees and customers. We do not want to re reinvent technology, design ideas that have been already generated. We try to acquire them through partnership, licensing, strategic alliances, and any other form of collaboration. And these form of collaborations, like a strategic alliances, have been existing for such a long time. But when we talk about open innovation, we talk about the degree, the intensity of collaborations. Because in the past, maybe two companies used to work together. But as you remember in the very beginning of the slide, I told you clusters is not enough. Because clustering is two, three companies, is four companies, is not enough. We need everyone involved. If you make tomato juice, everyone in the world which ma who makes tomato juice can be your partner, can be your competitor, can be a source of information, can be a source of improvement, can be also a customer. So, you sell tomato juice in America, okay. If I sell tomato juice in Indonesia, I can learn from you, you can learn from me, and it's open. But open does not mean that you tell all your secrets to strangers. Open means that you select 
those who can help you and then evaluate the idea. If you find this partnership is going to be useful, you do it. So we do not hide our failures and mistakes and we learn from others. Why, what do you mean, Navid? I don't understand your question. Navid, please uh, elaborate on your question. Okay. When you want to involve people, you know, if you are the CEO, if you are the top manager, you need to build a strong case. And the question you are asking, Navid, is the question that many company CEOs ask. It's not only you. You need to sit down, have a couple of meetings with the top managers to come up with a strategy. Of course, if you are only a middle manager, you cannot um, really push this idea forward because you're a middle manager. If you are a CEO, if you are, you have a strong position in your company, you have people who support your ideas, and this is very important. The, the power that you have as a top manager can make people in the board, on the board, sit and listen to you. And you have to build a case. You, it's not that you say that I want to move to open innovation from tomorrow we do it. No. There are always skepticals on the board of uh, management and they ask you questions. They say that uh, why do you think open innovation is useful for our company? How are you going to do that? What are the costs involved? What are the benefits that we get out of open innovation? You have to come up with answers for all of these questions. You have to persuade them. You have to bring facts to them. It's your job, like a lawyer, to build a case. When you're a lawyer, they say that and the guy you are defending in the court is a criminal and he has to uh, die. He has to go to prison for 50 years. You're a lawyer. You say that, no, I have a case. I have a very strong case that shows that this uh, defendant is uh, not guilty. It is your job to convince the jury, the judge, uh, that your defendant is not guilty. If you cannot convince them your, your defendant is guilty, you lose the course and court and the guy goes to prison for 20 years. So it's, it's your ability, how you convince them. Um, the architecture of open innovation is that we increase our collaboration by extending business processes. We establish joint meetings to collaborate with uh, partners, customers, suppliers. 
We establish joint programs with universities, partners, related departments, customers. And we invite external experts to train our staff frequently. By frequently, I mean really frequently, not once a year, not twice a year. And we send our staff to training courses, fairs, exhibitions regularly. So open architecture also involves that we have established learning systems. And you see that learning is in everywhere. It's in normal innovation. It's in closed innovation. It's an open innovation. Because you need to learn from your mistakes. Also, you need to learn new things. We have established processes in our organizations to capture the experience and gain out of failures. We have a fair and a square reward system to motivate people because open innovation is just like innovation and you need to open it, uh, motivate people. You need to compensate for the new ideas coming from any source but in the normal innovation or closed innovation, you need to motivate only your staff. In open innovation, you need to motivate your partners. Say that, for example, if we reduce the cost of shipping materials, products from America to Africa, uh, we are going to sign a 20-year contract with you to secure your job as our shipping partner. So for the next 20 years, you are going to be the only company which helps us ship our products from North America to Africa. This is your motivation. Now go find a way. How can we cut the price of shipping by 20%? Motivation works. You get 20% less shipping cost. The guy gets 20-year contract from you. Bingo, open innovation works. Open source. Open source means that we move from the mere knowledge generation to knowledge connection. We let our partners use the accumulated knowledge and experience created within our organizations. We try to create mutual intellectual property agreements. We sign partnership contracts to create R&D partnership and we form global innovation network. So what we had here, we had standards, we had architectures, and we had sources. Next session, I'm going to talk about the key success factors of open innovation and the rationale for R&D partnership and close the discussion. So take a two minute, three minutes pause, rest a little bit, and then I, I'm going to upload, um, I guess, Farid's presentation. Let me see here. Farid is going to present, and who else is going to present? Mustafa? Very well. Uh, just one question. Do you agree with me that this is the eighth session or ninth session? Okay. Very well, very well. Now take your two, three minutes and Farid, uh, after that you're the presenter. Okay, Perry, thank you very much for your presentation. 
it was a presentation uh, within the time limit. Uh, it was very good. Uh, and um, now let's see what your classmates can ask you. Uh, please ask your questions from Farid because um, you need to participate. Okay, any questions? All right. Always the next. Mustafa is the next speaker. The speaker. Mustafa, uh, did you send me your PowerPoint? Okay. Let me. See. Okay, I make Mustafa the presenter. Presentation. Can anyone, can anyone hear me? Hear you, Mustafa, but um, you need to upload your PowerPoint. Can, can, can you anybody hear me? Okay. Just, just uh, I'm sharing uh, my file uh, from my desktop, but it tells me take. Uh, Okay. Okay. Yeah, it's a, it's on uh, okay. it's on the process, uh, sir. Just uh, it will take few seconds to uh, upload it completely. And now can uh, anyone see my presentation? And yes, we can please? see. Uh, I'm, I'm going to present the uh, presentation which was prepared by me last week. Uh, 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 under the uh, subject of SWOT analysis. Uh, first of all, I have uh, a brief introduction from this presentation. Yeah, sure, sure. 
sir, would you uh, please uh, turn off your mic, please? Yeah. Well, thank you, sir. Uh, I uh, made at, at, at the beginning a brief introduction uh, on my uh, presentation, which includes uh, first the history of uh, SWOT analysis, then what is SWOT analysis, aims of SWOT analysis, who needs a SWOT analysis, also a brief. Uh, 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 Mr. David, uh, can you hear my voice? Mr. Navid, I think uh, we cannot hear my voice uh, very well. Okay, what about others? Okay, okay. <coughs> uh, how to do how to do a SWOT analysis? Uh, just uh, a, a, a brief presentation regarding this. SWOT analysis framework create a plan of action, which uh, is always comes up with carrying uh, a SWOT analysis inside or inside the organization. Uh, application of SWOT, SWOT analysis in one of the Afghan factories, uh, uh, which uh, will be coming in the next slide. Also references. I'm going a little bit faster because uh, I have uh, prepared, unfortunately, uh, about uh, uh, 50 or 20 slides. Uh, I'm going a little bit faster. The story. SWOT analysis uh, techniques, uh, uh, technique is created by Albert Humphrey, uh, who led a recent project at Stanford, uh, Stanford University in 1960 and 1970. Uh, of course, it was the first uh, time that uh, the SWOT analysis car uh, carried out by uh, this guy, which was Albert Humphrey, uh, un uh, a U.S. Uh, uh, scientist. <coughs> What is SWOT analysis? Actually, it is a technique, uh, a technique or a process that to enable professionals to look at everyday problems and strategy from new and fresh perspectives. Uh, it is just a, a brief, and uh, I think it's a, it's a brief and comprehensive uh, 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 definition for a SWOT analysis, which uh, I found it here. Uh, I uh, actually found uh, uh, several definitions for SWOT analysis that I uh, prefer to share this one with you all. <coughs> Continuing, uh, generally use SWOT analysis as a strategic planning tool. Uh, of course, planning tool used to evaluate the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and traits. Which uh, the two first one, the strengths and weaknesses are inside the organization, and the opportunities and threats are outside the organization uh, uh, environment. Uh, what is the strength? Uh, we can uh, say that all the resources inside the organization, all the capabilities that can be used as a basis for developing competitive advantage called the strength. The strength. What is the weaknesses? Weaknesses, actually, the absence or the lack of uh, a certain strength may be uh, viewed as a uh, weakness. We have uh, 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 some other definitions for weaknesses as well in the next slides, which will be uh, become a uh, uh, later. Opportunities in the treats or anti organization. Opportunities are the potential area for profit and growth, the potential uh, uh, facility for developing also the, 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 the organization. Also treat uh, uh, maybe uh, some negative factors which can affect our in uh, our organization in the, in the, the negatively in the future that uh, cause treat, which is uh, actually Generated from our uh, external environment of our organization. Uh, aims of SWOT analysis uh, to take the advantage of available strength and opportunity, uh, or to take the advantage of uh, some positive factors, some positive minds uh, which are existed inside our organization. And also, uh, which are existed or present outside of our organization. Number two, to minimize the impact of weakness. 
a white tree. These are also the negative. These are the negative from inside our organization, which could be like a weakness, and uh, the, the negative uh, factors which could be viewed as a tree. To avoid them, it uh, uh, may be reached by a SWOT analysis. Uh, generally, uh, the aims of SWOT analysis to review your competitive advantages, analyze your prospects for sales, profitability, and product development, to prepare your company for problems, allow for development of contingency plans, as a process to identify where you are strong or vulnerable. Strong we have the strengths inside our organization, our vulnerable, vulnerability, the weaknesses, the weakness points in our organization. To analyze, uh, the analysis can be performed on a product, service, company, or even an, in the, uh, in an individual. It is not actually for, uh, only for organization. It can be provided or can be performed by uh, for example, for, uh, for, uh, on a product, uh, service, company, or even in, in individual issues with the We need a SWOT analysis. A company, uh, an organization, department, a business unit, uh, of course, a business plan, a marketing plan, a job holder, job seeker, all of them needs to do the SWOT analysis themselves. How to do a SWOT analysis? First of all, we have to collect the information from inside the firm. Less we should list all the strengths and weaknesses one by one. Uh, this interview are three brainstorming but in a group of employees, for example, or group of workers inside the organization. What might be outside the firm? We should list all opportunities and all the trees which are uh, presented outside the firm. The opportunities uh, uh, are the actually are the potential future strengths for our organization. That opposite point in opposite point the trades are the potential future weaknesses maybe act as a potential future witness for our organization. At the end of uh, analyzing the strengths, weaknesses, and opportunities and traits, we have to make a plan of action how to cope with traits, how to cope with weaknesses, and how to uh, enhance, how to empower our strengths and opportunities. Make a, make a plan of action based on the above mentioned findings. In summary, we need to maintain our belt upon our leverage our strengths. We need to limit it, change our stocks or weaknesses. We need to prioritize, capture the belt hard and optimize the opportunities which are existing inside or, uh, outside our uh, organization. We need to be counter to minimize or manage those uh, trades uh, which are located or existed outside our organization. Uh, finally, <coughs> how to do a SWOT analysis? We have to use the Primo F uh, formula for evaluating uh, the internal factors. The Primo F uh, covers all the bases. Uh, for example, uh, uh, P is uh, stand for people into the organization, resources, innovation, uh, marketing, oper operations, and finance. Also, for uh, covering all the external factors, we have to use the pistol. Uh, formula, which is politics, economics, social, technological, legal, and environmental factors. We have actually a framework uh, which uh, is uh, uh, 
uh, uh, uh, written to you, and uh, which I made uh, this framework. Actually, uh, I got uh, these uh, information from uh, several intended sites and uh, some of the uh, books which uh, was uh, presented with me. So I draw uh, this, uh, this framework. Uh, if you want to uh, do uh, a swap bot analysis, we have to analyze all the environmental inside and outside our uh, uh, firm or our organization and uh, environmental factors, which uh, the insights uh, are internal analysis. We have to focus on the strengths and weaknesses uh, inside our organization, uh, strengths and weaknesses inside our organization. Also, if you uh, would like to uh, do analysis of the external environment. We have to uh, focus on opportunities which are existed outside of our organization, also the tools which may be eff uh, which may affect our organization in the future. Uh, we have to make uh, uh, this kind of uh, table, a kind of our uh, uh, analysis, uh, which uh, shows the trends. We can list all of them here and also the weaknesses, uh, which uh, both of them are uh, present inside the organization. Then we go to outside uh, factors, which are the opportunities and the positive factors and tweets, the negative factors. We can uh, uh, use this table for analyzing better these factors. At the end, uh, we have to make a plan of action based on the uh, previ previous findings. We have to capitalize on our strength, uh, which was found inside our organization. We have to overcome or minimize uh, our weaknesses, which were present in inside our organization. Actually, we have to take, uh, then we have to take at the least of some new opportunities as an organization, which may be uh, lots of opportunity we have or lots of uh, 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 weaknesses we have in the organization. Also, to respond to trees, uh, which uh, will be uh, presented as a completion. Uh, after uh, looking at these steps, after completing these steps, we have to make uh, a general plan, uh, setting goals and objectives, and, uh, like other uh, planning uh, process. <coughs> this one, uh, this one, uh, generally, uh, some of the uh, uh, general statements regarding how to do SWOT analysis. It is aimed uh, and uh, finally uh, the making a plan of action uh, after analyzing the SWOT. Uh, now uh, I have uh, here a brief information regarding the Guri uh, cement factory, which is one of the uh, uh, most famous factors in management. Reducing cement in uh, one of the uh, provinces of the Netherlands, which is Bahman problem. Actually, I uh, noted down some of the uh, main points uh, here, but not analyzed each one and not categorized each one in uh, 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 different parts of the SWOT analysis. We will have, uh, we will have. Uh, uh, the, the analysis of the, this, uh, these points in the next slide, of course. Uh, the Southern Afghan cement uh, uh, manufacturing factory located in Portland, province of Afghanistan, uh, which uh, maybe all of our classmates may have uh, may have known this factory, or at least uh, um, they may have heard the, the name of this factory. It started as activity or production in 1962, but uh, during the uh, internal war, it, its activities was stopped uh, due to, to some conflicts uh, around the country. Uh, okay, uh, sir, uh, uh, would you like uh, to say something? I can't hear you. Would you please repeat? I, I can't hear you, uh, sir. Uh, uh, okay. Uh, okay. I'm uh, now. Uh, is it okay with you, sir? Now, yes. Yes. Just uh, maybe our uh, the, uh, after uh, completing the SWOT analysis, uh, 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 we'll read some factory found to the following point: uh, the strengths, 
Uh, we have experienced uh, enthusiastic staff inside the, the, the factory, uh, which are really uh, would like to work hard and would like to uh, 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 complete their task on, uh, on a given time uh, with better quality. Good quality of product it is one of other strengths uh, which is existed in uh, this factory. Good brand name or place and location in the market. It has uh, a very good name inside uh, the name uh, and uh, location inside the Afghanistan market. Also, even in some of the neighbor uh, countries, prefer to buy uh, the products of this factory. Uh, another uh, uh, strength is uh, the ability to increase the production rate. If uh, we provide some uh, some of us, uh, the support, uh, uh, which can uh, uh, could. Uh, solve the weaknesses inside this uh, factory, we will be able to increase the production rate of uh, this factory, of course. The, uh, the, uh, present, uh, the present weakness inside this factory, uh, the old machinery or the old technology which was used in this factory, of course, it, it, is from, it remained from uh, very far, uh, uh, very uh, for years, uh, maybe more than 40 years, uh, next to uh, more than 40 years, I think. Uh, it is one of the weaknesses this factory uh, has. Some parts of the, the system needs renovation or even change. It is one of also oh, one of the uh, main uh, weaknesses which we uh, should support it. Low staff salary or benefits. It is one of the weaknesses which is sometimes to motivate the staffs for working hard or uh, being so enthusiastic around the factory. Shortage of power uh, and electricity. It is one of uh, also one of the weaknesses which prevent the, the this factory to increase the production rates and uh, should be uh, considered one of the main uh, weaknesses of this factory. The opportunities which are existed outside of the, 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 the factory is a good place in the market. Uh, 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 Any time we uh, if we increase the, the, the production rate, we will have a uh, lot of market inside and outside the, the country, uh, which it, it, it makes a good opportunity for us. Uh, presence of enough raw materials close to the factory is also one of the opportunities which can support us for increasing the, the, the production rate and the productivity rate. Cheap raw material. As all of the raw materials are close to the factory, it will be uh, very, uh, it will cost us very cheaply uh, to uh, use them. The treats which, uh, which are available it should be, uh, 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 should, uh, uh, we should have uh, a good plan for uh, uh, minimizing the effect of the uh, governmental support is one of the big problems which are existed, uh, which is existed outside the factory. So shortage of power, as I mentioned, and weaknesses, uh, it could be uh, uh, categorized as, inside, uh, as, uh, as a negative point inside the factory and also as a negative point outside the factory because uh, this factory does not have its own. Uh, uh, power making facility. It uh, should be uh, uh, by uh, it should be bought from out outside of the uh, uh, supply outside of the, the company. Export of uh, export of coal to other country, uh, countries. It's also one of the trees which uh, increased uh, the the. Uh, uh, price of coal uh, in Afghan, Afghan uh, 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 market it is also uh, one of the uh, treats which I treated, uh, treated this company uh, uh, from, uh, uh, from last uh, two or three years. Uh, presence of other countries' products in the market, especially the Pakistani and cement, uh, cement inside the uh, country is one of them. The big challenges for this uh, uh, factory to to, uh, uh, to increase our uh, to to uh, increase the capital. Okay,
Damping policy of some neighbor countries is one of also one of the big challenges, uh, external challenges for this factory, which uh, should be uh, considered uh, in, in making a plan of action. Then uh, Mustafa, the Mustafa, uh, your yeah. time is up. Okay, I but but I'm very happy with your work. So, how many more slides do you have? Uh, just uh, it's uh, just the the the, fin the finishing question. Just this is the last also, also uh, speak a little bit louder. Okay, uh, speak a little bit louder. Okay, okay. Uh, it, it, this is the last uh, uh, slide. I think uh, the just uh, let me check. Yeah, yeah. This is the last slide. Uh, the uh, plan of action. Uh, uh, actually, uh, uh, during the, 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 uh, the previous slides, I, uh, I uh, uh, told you that uh, the plan of action will be uh, prepared based on the uh, findings uh, from SWOT analysis, based on findings of the strengths, weaknesses, and uh, uh, opportunities and threats which we found from analysis of internal and external factors uh, inside and outside organization, the positive factors and the negative factors. It is uh, 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 we, I, uh, 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 haven't made any plan of action, so I became uh, the owner of this factory, then I will prepare a plan of action for the taking uh, uh, good uh, actions for improving this uh, factory. This was all, and uh, the references, uh, uh, which I have uh, made this presentation is uh, here. It is uh, the last slide. Uh, my my presentation finished. Sir. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, we should all clap for Mustafa because what I liked about his presentation was that he really applied plot analysis. Thank you, sir. Uh, into a very real play, uh, case. And that's exactly what I expect you to do. Of course, he could not manage the time very well. This was the weakness. <laughs> uh, but on the other hand, he did a great job of really applying plot case into a real company in Afghanistan. And, and I like it very much, Mustafa. Thank you very much. Now I make myself presenter. Okay. And, okay. Let me pause the record. So, uh, we, nobody leaves the class. I officially close the class. I uh, stop the recording. Okay. Uh, our exam will be on the 15th and 22nd of December. And I received the presentation on these two days. And that's it. So I will score you based on the, qu the quality of your answers to my questions and the quality of your presentations. Every presentation is only 15 minutes. If you cannot finish within 15 minutes, I will stop you. I don't want you to tell everything in your presentation. I want you to read the paper very well, maybe each paper three times, just to present the main idea. This is your uh, skill, this is your art, how to present the main idea. How to choose what is the most important part of the paper. Is it the theoretical framework? Is it the analysis? What part of theoretical framework, what part of theory, what part of empirical uh, discussion? Because a paper might have a very long result part, but two, three of the results are very important and the rest are minor. So you are going to receive each two papers. Okay, and I will going to email you. Yes, there will be some instructions. Okay, I will I will write you in an email. 